It's not about the constitution. It's not about what's written down. It's about how the society is organized in terms of its fundamental organizing principles. And so you could have a beautiful constitution that people call the best constitution in the world, but you could also have the most unequal society in the world like we have in South Africa. Coming into effect in 1996, the South African constitution is often referred to as the best in the world. Some academics are, however, questioning this narrative. University of Pretoria Jurisprudence Department HOD Professor Joel Mudiri asks whether our constitution is meant to serve all South Africans. I'd ask the question, the best constitution for who? Yeah, based on whose reality, based on who's experienced, based on whose idea of what a good society, a just society, a fair society is to look like. My own uh, view of the South African constitution is that it's not the best constitution of the world for a vast majority of Africans, South Africans who are still reeling from um, nearly three to four hundred years of, of colonial oppression and apartheid violence. And I think we need to have a different conversation about uh, the kind of society that we live in. The question is not whether this is the best or worst constitution in the world, even though I think that the language of best constitution in the world uh, silences, papers over a lot of the contradictions and inequalities that our society continues to face. It's a celebratory narrative that is now out of sync with the sentiment of a large part of our society which sees these social contradictions, uh, particularly social contradictions around race, around land, but also around inequality, gender inequality, gender-based violence, and so on and so forth. So I have doubts about whether it's the best constitution. I even have doubts about whether it's our constitution. I even have doubts about whether it's the right constitution for our society. Another voice questioning the honor bestowed upon our constitution is political analyst Asana Nguasheng. I mean, I think for me, the question is always uh, best con constitution for who, right? Who does the constitution of South Africa serve? And in its current incarnation, it doesn't really serve the people. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So we have a constitution that is based on number one principle, the respect for the rule of law, right? And the respect for individual property rights. We are coming from a history of South Africa, a South Africa that was stolen. The land was stolen from the natives of this land and taken by the white people of uh, who are now of South Africa, but who were coming from Europe, right? And so we have this history of colonialism, and then it's complicated by the history of apartheid, which is another form of colonialism. And then 1994 comes, and we want to wipe the slate clean and pretend as if the crimes that took place during colonialism and the crimes that took place during apartheid didn't happen. And so when you build a constitution as if you are building a new nation where nothing happened or came before it, you make some very critical mistakes, which we are beginning to pay for. With growing inequality and deepening levels of poverty, Mudiri says the majority of South Africans continue to suffer under our current legal system. I think there's a real urgent social question about whether the constitutional foundations of society uh, are appropriate to address in particular uh, the, the, the suffering and the historical challenges that are faced by, by, the, by the black majority population. And this constitution, in my view, does not answer some fundamental questions in the way that a truly liberatory constitution could or might if we imagined uh, such a possibility. There is also the issue of land restitution and redistribution. I know that the government, for example, has a land restitution program. I know that people sometimes get given money for the land that they lost, but you cannot compensate people who lost land with the little monies that people are getting. Because what is land? Land is something upon which you can farm land and get food. You can sell land and get money. You can rent land out and get money. And so if three generations ago, your family was dispossessed of land, you were not only dispossessed of land, you were dispossessed of an economic means of survival. And on top of that, you were disconnected from your cultural links and ties. And more often than not, your graves were desecrated when you were moved forcibly, right? And so you've lost your connection to your ancestors. That's a disjuncture there. Yeah. You've lost your connection to 
your cultural rights and your ability to, to implement your cultural rights because they require you to be in the place where your ancestors are who now no longer exist because they were moved, their bones were moved, right? And you've lost your connection to whatever your people's kind of means of, of production and livelihood is. And so we created this monster where we said those with title deeds were kind of the supreme South Africans. Mm -hmm. Those who were holding title deeds physically in their hands, those were those are actually like the now the, the first class South Africans, and everybody else is a second class citizen. And what we've done is we've replicated inequality, right? And so people who were poor now continue to be even more poor. And the, the, the means of recourse are so expensive that you have to spend many years in the South African justice system to go from the magistrate court until you finally reach the constitutional court. Is a legal system based on African laws and values the answer to our legal challenges? The legal system is simply a reflection of a larger relation of power and inequality that, 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 that characterizes colonial apartheid and the continuation of colonial apartheid into post-1994. I do think that um, one of the major tasks for legal scholars and for people in general is to learn African languages, to learn African history, to understand African philosophical and spiritual conventions and traditions and consider them as useful, important, and valid ways of responding to our social reality. I suppose that's what people have been calling decolonization. But um, to simply single out law alone as Western without looking at the whole way in which our human reality has been configured through the process of conquest, I think uh, would absolutely be a mistake. We've always had legal frameworks, right? So when we were colonized, it's not as if we didn't have frameworks. We had legal frameworks. And African law can provide us a lot of the answers that we are looking for. But of course, it's going to have to be updated to rethink some elements around patriarchy and you know the fact that under African law in its original form, a woman could not inherit, et cetera, et cetera. And so those were the things that the constitution was supposed to grapple with, to say there is this African law that our people have always existed under. How do we take this African law and make it the law of the land? Because in the main, African law is actually very just in terms of how do you deal with somebody who has stolen uh, livestock from somebody? You find them. It, it's a similar system to the legal system, but it actually has a restorative, a restorative justice element. And it actually has an element of engagement of the aggrieved and the aggriever which isn't always present in the Roman Dutch system, right? And the Roman Dutch system is highly problematic precisely because it relies on this thing called an interpreter of the law, a lawyer, which costs money. Whereas if you are implementing an African system, for example, it should be that as a South African, I am able to go to court as far as the highest court of the land without having a lawyer and able to argue my case. And it should be that the judge must hear my case on the basis of my representation, because that is true access to the law. So how can the constitution of South Africa serve the marginalized and dispossessed masses? of our country. The solutions for me is to go back to the drawing board, knowing what we know now, almost 30 years after, you know, more than 30, almost 30 years after this, this constitution was established in 1996, we need to go back to the drawing board. And in going back to the drawing board, we need to think about what is the current country that we are living in and what are the lessons that we've learned over the past almost 30 years and how do we begin to fix until we begin to challenge and question the things that are keeping these structural inequalities in place, these injustices in place. We are not going to go very far as South Africa. It's not about the constitution. It's not about what's written down. It's about how the society is organized in terms of its fundamental organizing principles. And so you could have a beautiful constitution that people call the best constitution in the world, but you could also have the most unequal society in the world like we have in South Africa. And But what we need is a political and legal ordering that bridges that divide between promise and reality. And this constitution cannot do that because its origins, its premises, and, 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 and its surrounding uh, ways of understanding 
understanding is the discourse surrounding it is not responsive to this problem of colonial apartheid for a whole set of, 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 of reasons.